great. Natural settling in the room, that's, that's great. <laughs> we um, may start, it gives me great pleasure, it's a real privilege um, to introduce uh, my uh, collaborator and colleague, Professor Mark Greenberg, um, who is the endowed, uh, Bennett Endowed Chair of Prevention Research at Penn State in um, America. Um, Mark has got an extraordinarily impressive body of work um, on the prevention of emotional and behavioral problems in young people right the way across the translational pathway from basic work to effectiveness work and perhaps most impressively at the real implementation end of things. I certainly, like many people who I know, have a set of his papers that I repeatedly go back to and find real depth and real um, uh, expertise in his papers. Um, the fact that his work has been cited, I think, nearly 30,000 times suggests that many other people also highly regard his work. So um, I think that's because he asks great questions, uses really brave methodologies, certainly doesn't hug the intellectual shoreline in any sense at all, um, and his work is having a fantastic impact, not just in North America, but around Europe and the world as well. So over to you, Mark. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> So, good morning, and um, uh, I've sort of made it a tradition recently uh, that uh, when I give a talk on mindfulness, we do a little bit of mindfulness at just the beginning, just for a minute or two to bring our, our bodies and our minds together into the room. So, you just uh, make a, come comfortable in what you might call a noble position in which you think about your head as having a string tied to the beautiful sky we have today. And if we just close our eyes for just a short period of time. Or, right? So I'm going to talk about the potential value today of, of thinking about contemplative practices uh, and the, what I'm going to call the interpersonal aspects of mindfulness. And I'm going to do that in the context of thinking about mindfulness in schools and particularly I'm going to focus on mindfulness in teaching. We do work at, at Penn State, as I'll discuss with you, in a variety of areas with, with children, with youth, with teachers, and with parents. But today I'm going to focus mostly on the teacher work. Okay. So uh, this began for me. I, I uh, was invited to be one of the uh, speakers with His Holiness in Dharamsala in, a, in a, a, one of the many mind and life meetings. I think there's about 35 of them now, five-day meetings. This was in Dharamsala in 2000, which eventuated in this book, Destructive Emotions. And the, to the topic of this meeting was, are, are, are some de emotions destructive? Uh, and how do we think about that from the West and from, from the East? But um, it, it brought together my own work in a new, new way. I'd been doing social-emotional learning work for already about 25 years. And I also was a meditator, first of a Vipassana meditator, starting in the early 70s. But since 1986, I've had a teacher that comes from the, uh, the, the Vedic tradition of Ramana Maharshi in, uh, in India, and I go to India on a yearly basis. So I always kept my personal mindfulness practice and spiritual work completely separate from my work in science. And at this meeting, I realized for the first time that they actually could begin to merge. And so that's what's happened since, since then. So I'm, I developed a curriculum that's used quite a, a bit. That's why I'm in the UK this week. Uh, it's called the PADS curriculum. It's a social emotional curriculum for children. And um, the reason I was invited to speak with His Holiness, I think, was that um, at that time there were no mindfulness curriculums for children. Not, not at all. In fact, no one was even really thinking deeply about it probably. But I was teaching kids, even four and five year olds, how to stop and calm down by doing what we call doing turtle, which is doing this and then taking a long deep breath, or maybe two or three deep breaths, to really calm down and, and develop self-regulatory capacity. And um, actually, I taught His Holiness to do this during one of the meetings, and he, he, it was a lot of fun. Um, but it wasn't quite getting to the point of where we are with mindfulness today. And so it, I began to think about uh, both what we did in the PAS curriculum and now where this could go in a broader sense. So in PAS, we, we focus on the golden rule, if you will, treat others the way you want to be treated. Uh, and uh, we focus on the awareness of emotional states, on putting feelings into words. This is for four to 12 year olds. Uh, the ability to calm down, of course, and I gave you one example of the way we do it with younger children. Uh, planning ahead and thinking effectively about uh, how to deal with problems before they occur. Think about that as uh, relapse prevention in the adult world and developing greater empathy and compassion for others. So we set these goals back in 1981 
So that the idea that many of these things which are reflected in many mindfulness interventions, um, uh, we had been doing for quite a long time. Uh, and they come from really the, what are called the core competencies of social emotional learning. Are any of you familiar with CASEL? In Chicago, it's a United States organization. And CASEL spent a lot of time trying to characterize what social and emotional learning is and really having five components. The two in, in red are sort of the uh, intrapersonal aspects of, 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 of social emotional development, which are learning to self-manage, right? Manage one's emotions. And you can think about a scope and sequence going from three-year-olds to adulthood and the ability to do that. Um, Self-awareness is being able to recognize your own emotions and your own values and strengths, as well as weaknesses. So those are both intrapersonal skills. Then there are the blue skills, which are the interpersonal skills around showing empathy and awareness. Of course, that starts with, if you, if you think of it with young children, first having a theory of mind or perspective taking, slowly moving into understanding others. And relationship skills, learning how to communicate, negotiate, persuade, etc. And these are all wrapped around uh, a broader cognitive ability, which is a problem solving and decision making. And, uh, and in that green circle, it's also the issue of ethics. How do you make ethical decisions? How do you use your problem solving skills in a way that, um, that meets the needs of both yourself and others. So that's sort of the fundamental model for social emotional learning that at least we use in the States, but many other countries like Singapore have, have adopted as their, as their national models. And so when I was doing PAS, I was trying to, to line up uh, these skills with what was going on with the development of the conceptual models of social emotional development. So now we're gonna to move to mindfulness, and what is mindfulness? Well, is mindfulness related to the, that circle? Well, I'd say in some ways, surely it is. And you know the traditional uh, Western definition, at least American definition by uh, John, that mindfulness is paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present, present moment. Um, I always found that def the definition interesting but insufficient. And, uh, and uh, so I've been excited that John in 2011 in the Journal of Contemporary Buddhist Studies, in his writing where there's been a lot of discussion about what mindfulness is, as you know, is a big topic these days said an awareness of one's conduct and the quality of one's relationships are intrinsic elements to the cultivation of mindfulness. Okay, and that's really moving, <coughs> moving these things into the interpersonal sphere in a new way. And of course he said mindfulness in everyday life is the ultimate challenge. <coughs> so um, it's one thing to sit on a pillow and, and uh, think that you are improving in your ability to maintain attention and awareness it's another thing to actually get off the pillow and, and uh, have, have changes in your behavior that represent uh, what we hope mindfulness is in an interpersonal context. Okay? And this has been the part of mindfulness that's been much more poorly elaborated, I think. So the, you, I don't think there's any way to separate mindfulness from ethics and cognition okay? in, a, in a broad sense. And uh, engaging in mindful awareness means not only being aware of the present, but it means reflecting and living a sense of a certain kind of ethics. In fact, the, the sati, the or original, although there's argument about all this, uh, definition of mindfulness is remembering, right? It's, it's not just being present in the moment, it's, it has to do with remembrance. And so the, the idea of doing not harm, no, no harm to others and having wholesome actions seems to be an intrinsic aspect in my, my view of mindfulness. Uh, so this involves re recollecting and reflecting on a set of values that are embedded in, in both your family, your community, your culture, et cetera, uh, rather than just being reactive to what's ever happening right now. So it's more than just being in the present moment. It's being in the present moment with all this remembrance, if you will. And uh, so in some ways we can say mindfulness is seeing things as they really are, uh, with clear comprehension and intentionality, and that means that you carry forward with you a great deal more than your just your existence in the present moment. And this, this is really what allows uh, the other parts of the Eightfold Path, uh, which is really, I think, um, when I think about my work with schools, I think about the Eightfold Path as being what drives the kind of thinking that we're doing. That um, while mindfulness is one aspect of the Eightfold Path, that uh, we're very interested with children and teachers with uh, right thought, right effort, right speech, et cetera. Okay? So how do we promote these things? How do we promote mindfulness and compassion in, uh, in people, and especially in schools? What does it mean? What does it mean to be caring or compassionate? Uh, uh, and um, 
So I think this is just my simple uh, weekly, de weekly working definition uh, of some capacity, as I think. One, of course, and central to that is to be attentive. Attentive and aware in, in the present moment. That's often why we think about um, practices that, that are focused on those capabilities. Uh, being sensitive to others and their needs and desires. Um, that sounds more like the circle definition in the castle, doesn't it? Okay. Um, uh, to be open-minded uh, is important. Uh, is to be truly present it means to be able to listen in an open-minded way, listening without judgment or what we might call deep listening. Uh, I think another component of that is, uh, is what His Holiness and others talk about in many religious traditions, which is recognizing our common humanity. Uh, how do we go about doing that? That's, that's, a, that's a real dilemma for me. I'm, I would love to have some discussion on how you think we can do that better. And acting from a ground of ethics of, of doing no harm. You know, how do we instantiate that and in work with teachers or with kids or with families or in therapy? I'm not really sure. But, and then the question is in what ways we promote these uh, in schools and families, the students, etc. So that's my dilemma. That's what I've been sort of trying to get my, my, my arms around. So nurturing mindfulness in schools is part of a larger, I see it as part of this larger domain of social emotional learning. That's why I gave you, showed you the circle first. It's not something by itself. It's, it's a, a, what I think is a, a, one set of adjunctive ideas to a much larger field. Um, it's changing rapidly. Uh, it's very hard to keep up with uh, what's going on, just like in mindfulness in general. I think probably only proteonomics is putting out more papers quickly than, uh, than mindfulness right now. There are lots of new ideas coming to fruition and a very creative time. It's the first, first 10 years, really, of, the, of this work with kids. Mm -hmm. But there's still very little high-quality research. Um, uh, I hope, hope I'll give you some examples today. Few well-designed studies with follow-up. In fact, uh, Willem and, and the group, uh, Ray's study and, and Willem's study are the first two studies. We have no studies in the United States that have sufficient follow-up to be able to indicate anything about the effects of mindfulness with children, I would say. And your follow-ups were three months. Three months, OK. So that's the extent. When we look at what we know about mindfulness, even though there's a raging desire out there in many parts of the community to put mindfulness into every school tomorrow and parliamentary things here going on, et cetera, we have one study in the world that has a three-month follow-up. So let's be modest and humble about how much we don't know. The evidence is thin, to say the least, at this point. But that's the way a field begins. And I, I was in the same situation with social emotional learning uh, 30 years ago. Right now we have a large long-term term projects. So, so how can we think about contemplative deepening of what I showed you before? So uh, Rob Roser at Portland State and I have been working on this a little bit. Uh, how can contemplative practices sort of deepen, if you will, some of these qualities? Right? And I think there's a number of ways. One is that in self-awareness, it's there's a really deeper aspect in mindfulness of understanding the nature of mind. Now, that's not something that four-year-olds are going to do, but something that adolescents can begin to do, is to begin to understand that actually what is the nature of the mind, right? And stuff fundamental to any approach that's truly about mindfulness. And also, I think uh, there's the ways in which um, contemplative practice can deepen one's emotional awareness. Uh, in the self-management, um, Really, uh, the, the focus there, I think, that deepens in the mindfulness world is the issue of inhibitory regulation. Uh, so from a neurocognitive standpoint, many people in mindfulness have been interested in, in frontal control, if you will, mostly in the, in the DPC and how it can help regulate behavior and that mindful approaches can, um, can help one to inhibit, uh, inhibit and regulate. And that's really about the deployment of attention. That's because attention is being practiced. Okay? So the practice issue is important there. In the area of social awareness, um, I think that even though most mindfulness approaches with children or adults have not done this very well, that I think the uh, issue of high help to, helping people to learn to become more compassionate uh, is a possibility. I don't think we've gone very far with it very, very, very well yet so far, but I think it's where things will go. Uh, in terms of relationship skills, the idea of mindful listening and dialogue uh, and how to actually listen well to people. This is a, this is a, a gift that very few people have and that um, some, but very few, mindfulness approaches have begun to incorporate. Okay, like the uh, Gregory Kramer's interpersonal mindfulness is an example of an approach like that. Uh, and potentially, it's potential that these mindfulness approaches could also help people to manage conflict in new ways. 
Although, as I'll say, almost all of, the, all of the mindfulness work so far has been in the red area. It's very little on compassion, empathy, and almost none on relationship behavior, how people manage their relationships. And, and lastly, responsible decision making. Well, there's, there's a critical part of mindfulness, I think, in the, in the deep sense, which is stating facts without judgment. It's being able to, to just be, uh, see reality uh, clearly uh, and uh, comprehend things in a, in a different way that's less personalized. And, and then, of course, making ethical choices. Uh, if one thinks of ethics, as I said earlier, as part of mindfulness, then that I think it's a way to deep and social-emotional learning. So um, I think there's cert also certain practices, contemplative practices, that deepen uh, social-emotional learning in a broader sense. One is because, as I said, as just said, there's a specific focus on attentional capacities. And attentional capacities are really important in many ways. They're important for emotion regulation. They're important for understanding the nature of mind. And they're important for um, thinking, for the ability to maintain uh, accurate, um, uh, the, the ability to hold things in mind in a way that can help children become more successful in school. Although there's no data, not an iota of data, mindfulness improves academic achievement. Okay, at this point, I don't know any studies that even have a post-test effect of that so far. Uh, I think the second thing is it focuses on practice and repetition in learning. And uh, one of the most important things about mindfulness approaches is they involve a lot of practice and repetition. And we know that, that the way that children learn best is through practice and repetition. I don't believe in the new math. <laughs> uh, really learning your times tables by clapping and learning and using embodied uh, approaches like I did when I was a kid. We, we know that children learn best when they have embodied practice over and over again. Okay? And so that's one thing that mindfulness brings to this approach. Focusing on acting with wisdom and compassion. Well, I wish there was more of that than there is right now in the mindfulness world, but I think that's uh, a place where I think things are going. And lastly, I think because contemplative practices are broad, they can help us bring in the arts and music uh, and, and different ways of using contemplation. Okay? It's not, it, not going to be mostly, uh, at least for children and maybe for teens, sitting on a pillow. Right? It's not gonna, I don't think it's the way we're going to most successfully teach children to be contemplative and caring. Okay. So nurturing and mindfulness in schools part of that large, oops, sorry, do I ever repeat it? Oh, okay. So there's a number of strategies we could use to deepen social emotional learning by adding mindfulness, okay? And I think that, uh, that mind up and dot B are examples of this. They come from a social emotional learning broad background, I think, but they focus on mindfulness as the focus. Uh, we, I, I've been doing trials on yoga interventions uh, in inner city uh, uh, Baltimore and the effect of yoga interventions for kids and, and how they might help them with self-regulatory skills. Um, there are teacher interventions. I'm going to talk about those today that are, um, that are focused on teacher mindfulness. But we can also add mindfulness to current interventions. Uh, we've done this in a series of trials uh, of mindfulness-based strengthening families program. Uh, and um, we could add components of, of, um, to SEL programs. So for example, we might take a traditionally high quality SEL program and add mindfulness to it and see if, it, it, if its added component makes a difference. Although there have been no trials like that so far that I know of. Or to teacher training. Okay. <laughs> so that's the idea is to, in this field is uh, we need to stretch, gently stretch to conclusions instead of jumping to them. The, 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 the period of mindfulness work now with children and families and schools is very similar to SEL 30 years ago where the practitioners are way ahead of the science and uh, they're making uh, broad and vast claims for incredible effects of these programs. And I don't think that there are incredible effects of any program. Okay? I've been 35 years of doing this. If we have modest effects on specific variables and have a, we have a good theory uh, of how they work, it'll be a big advance, okay? Uh, it's not the, the best thing since sliced bread, as we say in America. It's just another way that we can teach children and adults how to become better, okay? So at Penn State, we've been, we have a center called Peace as part of the Prevention Center, and we have focused on three areas, mindfulness and teaching. It's what I'm gonna talk about today. We have been working on mindful-based parenting, large randomized trials, and uh, we've been doing mindfulness programs for children. We've been doing uh, yoga programs in inner city Baltimore, but we've also been studying a number of other programs, including Learning to Breathe. Uh, it's another program like .B, both in college students, where we've just shown effects on 
on binge drinking, and also um, in high schools. But today I'm going to really focus on the mindfulness and teaching. So why am I doing that? I think because what we're really interested in doing is building nurturing environments. That's the, that's the fundamental broad goal, I believe, uh, from a public health standpoint. And there's much yet to be learned about promoting mindfulness in children. I don't think we know very much yet about how to do it or what its effects are, but helping adults to become mindful is essential. Okay? Uh, uh, as, as a superintendent of a large school district in America said to me, he said, the problem is not the students, it's my, my teachers, it's my staff. Right? If I can get the staff to move in new ways, to be innovative, and to think differently about what it means to be a teacher, then I'll be successful. I don't have to worry about the students. students. Students are not the issue. So in that same way, I think that working on the teacher issues are very important to this. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing mindfulness trials with, with youth, but um, I think that this is an essential component to it. And I think in dot B, there's a combination in that sense. So I've been thinking with other people, Larissa Duncan, uh, Doug Coesworth, and others, about what it means to be interpersonally mindful. What, what are the interpersonal aspects of this? Most of the effects of mindfulness have been done by looking at adults that have diseases, looking at uh, reductions in psoriasis, or pain, or depression, or addictive behaviors. Or it's been looking at the neurocognitive aspects of this. Uh, uh, the, the brain is very sexy these days, so neuroscience approaches that show something lighting up in a new area of the brain because of mindfulness has been very attractive. And then the third thing we've done is we've used self-reports of mindfulness in adults. But there's been very little work on the interpersonal aspects of mindfulness, and yet if we believe mindfulness is really of value in the long run, it'll not be just because people become more attentive or aware, but because they become more caring in their relationships. That it transfers to the interpersonal world. So what are the interpersonal aspects of this that we're interested in? We think there's really um, five or six things when we think about parents and teachers. Okay? The first is the ability to listen with full attention. Okay? So as a result, you would think we, we would want to focus on how to help people become better listeners. Okay? The second is to be present-centered in your awareness of your emotions, of both yourself and others. And part of that, I think, is facilitated by meditation practices that help you become more present-centered in a broader sense. Okay? To be open and uh, uh, non-judgmental, or we say low judgmental and, re and receptive to children's thoughts and feelings. If you're the parent, you can't be non-judgmental with a teenager, right? Yeah, we all agree? You can lower your, your judgmentalness, uh, but you're the parent there, the child, there's a boundary there, and, um, and you have to have some sense of judgment with a, with a teen, right? Or with a, pro or with a toddler. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we want people to become more self-regulated in the way they teach so that they're low in reactivity, right? They're not, they're not flying off the handle. And they're also low in automaticity, that they don't know what's happening ahead of time, that they're actually present in the moment when they're doing their teaching with kids. <laughs> and lastly, we want, third, uh, next to last, is we want to be aware and responsive to children's individual needs. This is hard for a teacher to, be, to actually see teachable moments. Because uh, when you're teaching, you're dealing with 25 or 30 students, you're trying to manage a group, and it's very hard to see and respond to teachable moments um, when, when you're in that situation. Even parents with just two or three kids find it very difficult. They often miss the teachable moment for a child. Okay? And lastly, because all the things I showed you so far are impossible to do. Right? There's, we're not gonna, there's, not a, there's not an asymptotic goal we're going to reach. To be compassionate with yourself and others about the ability to do these and to be uh, um, patient with yourself uh, and the ability to grow into doing these better, is, these better is critical. Or else it just becomes another judgmental practice. Right? Okay. So that's the kind of things we're interested in. And we focus our interventions on trying to do these things. Okay? That's sort of the model. So that's sort of the dilemma, right? I'm doing something very important like meditating, <laughs> as if that's the goal. The goal, I don't think, is med the meditation. So I'm going to talk about two projects today, CARE, uh, which was developed by Tish Jennings, Krista Turksman, Richard Brown, and I and a group of people at Penn State have been uh, uh, studying it, Tish Jennings being one of the scientists also. Uh, and um, it's based on a model of a paper that Tish and I wrote in uh, 2009. We're interested in, in, the, in the bottom line of students' social, emotional, and academic outcomes. We think that is driven by a healthy classroom climate, 
Healthy classroom climate is driven by healthy student-teacher relationships, good management, and often a good SEL program. But this is the key issue, teachers' own social and emotional skills and well-being. We think they drive all of these aspects, although they're almost never studied. Okay? So this paper was a conceptual paper trying to help people focus now on the idea that the teacher is the key issue and trying to understand and measure teachers' social and emotional abilities and well-being as the key to the chain of causal influences here. Okay? So as part of that, you'll probably have all heard about the burnout cascades in many, many papers, but people go from becoming emotionally exhausted to starting to depersonalize and then feeling a lack of accomplishment. And this is partly explains why in many countries, I don't know what it's like in the UK right now, but I've just been in Croatia and Israel, that the retention rate for teachers is only about 50% over the first five years. That's 50% of teachers that begin leave the profession. It's an amazing problem of social capital because we invest so much as a culture in training teachers and so many of them are unhappy and leave. And the depersonalization part of this is probably the most important part. That's when you start to see the kids as after you. And if you've talked to any teacher, this, that it's very easy to fall into this where they feel like the children are actually um, being bad because they're really trying to get at the teacher, to hurt the teacher. And how many have felt this as a parent? that your kids are really out to get you, right? So everybody has, has felt depersonalization at some time. But when you feel it for a while as a teacher, it can be very destructive because you begin to see them as little tyrants rather than as loving children that need more caring, right? And when that happens, all of your behaviors change, right? And usually you leave the profession sooner or later, hopefully. So the care model is a series of, of retreat sessions. It's five days long, two days at the beginning, usually over a weekend. Then one day between two weeks and two months later, another day between two weeks and two months later, and then usually a booster day, and then there's some phone coaching in between. Okay? So we're going to combine teaching mindfulness te techniques. Uh, uh, so there's, no, there's no curriculum here for students. This is not about the students. This is about teachers' own well-being and their own mindfulness applied to the context of being a teacher. Okay? But there's no child curriculum at all in care. In fact, when teachers start talking about that they're going to start doing these things with their kids, we say, well, you have to really think carefully about that. Okay? That's, not, that's not why we're here uh, to do this work. So it has a number of program elements. Um, it really comes from the meeting with His Holiness in 2000, in which um, uh, Richie Davidson and I and Alan Wallace, who some of you might know, Buddhist teacher, and uh, Paul Ekman were sitting on a sofa after the second day. And he turned to us very intentionally and he said, if there's um, so much knowledge from the East about the mindful, mindfulness and awareness, and there's so much knowledge from the West about emotions and, and the interpersonal world, why isn't there a curriculum to make healthy adults more compassionate and caring? That was a really interesting question because nothing like that existed, right? So actually, we felt that was our mission. We stayed up all night that night, pretty much, and started to, to, to develop the first version of this, which was called Cultivating Emotional Balance, and was trialed in San Francisco originally. Okay? Over the last 10 years, it's evolved and mutated in lots of ways uh, into two programs. One is CARE, which uh, I'll talk about today, and another which is SMART that Margaret Cullen uh, leads. Okay? But they have a lot of similarities. And that is they want to we want to combine these uh, SEL skills, if you will, for adults with teaching mindfulness skills. So we're focused on emotional awareness. We, we have a little bit of didactic lessons on actually the nature of emotions. Uh, we spend a lot of time on, uh, on them recognize, teachers recognizing the experience they have of emotions in the classroom with kids, like fear and anger and joy. Uh, and um, we do mindfulness practices, a number of them, including um, sitting meditation, short sitting meditations, uh, very brief meditations teachers can do on the fly, um, uh, body, body work, uh, a little bit of mindful movement, uh, and compassion training, which we call uh, caring practice, but it's meta. Okay? Uh, and uh, so we do and a little bit of mindful walking also. So we give them a variety of techniques. The idea is not like a, it's not like a meditation retreat where you're going to do an hour of sitting and an hour of walking and Instead, we're giving them a lot of different ideas and talking about how they can apply them as they're doing their work during the day, okay? or before they come to work, or afterwards. And then we spend time on applying, helping them apply these through discussions and role plays 
And then we have follow-up phone calls in between. How's it going? Have you been using the ideas? Tell us about it. And then they're coming back. So they're doing two days, getting the basics. Then they're coming back uh, two more times or three more times, including the booster. They're talking about what they have been doing, and then we add new ideas. Okay? So it's a retreat sort of model. First trial we did was a, a trial with just 50 teachers, random, randomized trial in uh, Pennsylvania, in a, in a, a small city that has very high risk uh, students, very, very low academic achievement. We did just a simple pre-post study, all self-report because of the funding of a pilot. Uh, and, um, and we did focus groups, qualitative and quantitative. So just really quickly, we found some significant effects on uh, teachers' report of their emotional well-being. These are published papers. Uh, this is the gross emotion regulation questionnaire. We found effects on teachers' report of their daily physical symptoms. So we have a long list of daily physical symptoms, mostly of aches and pains and et cetera, colds, et cetera. And we see a significant difference on, uh, on their well-being pre, <coughs> pre and post. This is the post-test effects adjusted for the pre-test, standardized mean differences. Uh, we used a measure of what we called hurry or time urgency because teachers are very pressed for time like most of us, even more so. And so they always feel rushed. And so we're very interested in if the mindfulness can reduce their sense of being rushed even though nothing has changed about their work. Okay, they have the same work to do. And we see a really significant uh, effect of that. Uh, and we had some effects on teachers' reports of, of efficacy, their, the sense of efficacy in the classroom. In the next trial, I won't show you the data, but we have no effects on efficacy. And these measures, because they're self-report, are very variable. Okay? Okay. And lastly, we had a small effect, uh, actually pretty significant effect on mindfulness, and it was mostly on the observe and non-react, for those of you that are interested in the five, five factors. There's a f main effect of the whole measure, but it was really on observe and non-reactiveness. Okay? So that's just a quick tour of the first study. Uh, and we did a lot of focus group work with teachers, very interested in, in combining mixed methods of qualitative work. This is just an example of a teacher saying, I've become more aware of the kids, more opportunities to talk to them, just more aware of myself in general, what I'm feeling, what I'm eating, what I'm doing, where I'm going. My awareness is just heightened. Right? So that's a, one aspect of this. Another part is sort of the decentering, uh, if you will, conceptual model of this. I'm much calmer even when I'm drinking coffee. My mind's not racing in a thousand places. I'm just liking my coffee. Right? So the idea is being present in the moment doing one thing. I have learned just to take things for what they are and not keep everything on my shoulders all the time because I'm not doing that it allows me to treat my kids better. Okay? Very simple. We have lots and lots of these kinds of quotes. It's just two examples. So now we're doing a large cluster randomized trial funded by the federal government. It's in New York City. It's in a very tough set of schools in the Bronx. High rate of ethnic minority students and a high rate of ethnic minority teachers. Uh, so another issue with this is acceptability of this across uh, cultures. Uh, it has a one-year follow-up and it looks at effects not only on teachers but also on students. And on teachers, not only on their self-reports but also on observing every teacher in every classroom before and afterwards on, an, uh, on a standardized measure. So it's quite an, quite an expensive project. It involves two cohorts and 36 elementary schools. Uh, it's done in two cohorts. We start with a small cohort because a lot of things happen wrong when you start a trial. <laughs> but we start with a small group to begin with and we got larger in the second cohort. You can see we have 226 teachers that are randomized, uh, mostly female but ethnically diverse. And, uh, and then we're following 536 students, 5,036 students, which is eight students chosen from each classroom that we're going to try to follow their behavior change also. Okay? So uh, there's no one, no one has exactly done a study like this before. I think we both have been studied at once in detail. So the care logic model is that we're, we're doing the program, the intervention, just like I told you, emotional skills instruction, mindful awareness, and caring practices. We're hoping that it'll improve teacher well-being, efficacy, and mindfulness. It will improve their classroom teaching, their observed teaching, and that will lead to improvements in students' behavior. So that's sort of the simple logic model. Of course, we could, de uh, uh, we, we could decompose this model into m multiple smaller models of the, of the processes. Uh, the procedure timeline is we recruited schools. They did online surveys. We observed the teachers at, uh, and pretest. They got the intervention or were randomized to the waitlist control group. They got the uh, training sessions. They got online self-reports and, and observations. And then, uh, and then we're following also the development of the kids. 
Uh, and of course it was randomly assigned, and this is a cluster randomized trial. So baseline, there were no differences, luckily, on our major variables. Uh, the randomization went pretty well, age, gender, et cetera, as you can see there. The analysis, of course, are all uh, tend to treat using hierarchical linear, linear models because there's a lot of clustering. Classrooms are clustered in the schools. Schools, uh, students are clustered in classrooms. So that's a three-level model for those of you who care about those things. <laughs> with lots of baseline scores that use this covariates, okay? So I'm just gonna give you a quick tour of very preliminary data. None of this is published yet. We've just been analyzing over the last uh, two or three months. Uh, because there are so many measures uh, that people wanna do in self-report, we uh, developed five aggregate factor structure measures of what, uh, with, what, with in our confirmatory factor analysis. Five factors came out on teachers' self-report behavior. The first one is efficacy. And um, there is a significant effect on efficacy. I'm sorry I said there wasn't before. There's a significant effect. So you can see this is the, so oops, this is the treatment, uh, pre-test and post-test, the control. And there is a significant effect on efficacy. Um, mindfulness, there's also a, a significant effect. Uh, and uh, I believe it's also, again, on both observe and non-react. This is replication. Uh, we have a significant effect, again, on the hurry aggregate, which is mostly the time urgency scale items, where uh, teachers in the treatment group are going down more in their sense of, of hurry or, or urgency. Uh, and we have a distress aggregate that involves uh, burnout, uh, generalized anxiety, depression from the PHQ, and perceived stress. They all come together into a, a, really a distress. Uh, we're, we're never measuring depression in a measure like this anyway. We're just measuring broad distress, I think. And we see a, a, a significant effect, it's at the 0.05 level in the aggregate uh, with uh, teachers in the treatment going down more than those in the, in the control group. These are modest effects, but these are large samples. Yeah. Questions at all? I'm, I know I'm going fast because I'm covering a lot of data. Do you have questions about this? Okay. So we did classroom observations. Teachers are, uh, we send blind observers, observers who are blind to condition. <laughs> Uh, to all of these schools all over New York City. This is a, as you can expect, expect, it's a very expensive project to do. They use a measure called the CLASS, which is a highly standardized, well-used measure, probably published in two or 300 trials in the United States, which measures three kinds of teachers' uh, ability to teach, which is their emotional support, their organization of the classroom, and their instructional support. There are versions separately for preschools, for, for primary schools, and for secondary schools. And all these teachers are primary school because we wanted to use one observational measure across all, all teachers. And we see a significant effect, uh, as you can see, in the, uh, in the treatment group. And what's happening basically is the control group is getting much worse across the year. And that's a, that's a standardized, well-known finding that if you look at teachers in the fall and you look at them at the spring, the burnout process, springtime, uh, um, that uh, teaching gets, uh, teaching quality gets lower in March and April. It's a well-known phenomena. There's actually good research data on this. Uh, forget May. <laughs> May is just field trips, same in, same in, in the UK, right? Uh, and, um, and so what we see is in the control group, a real decrement of teaching, and in, in the uh, treatment group, no decrement, basically. So it's a per, if you want to think of it, it's preventing poor emotional support across the school year. Uh, there's an improvement in their classroom organization, their ability to organize their class by the observer's report. See no difference in the control group, but a really large difference in the, uh, in the intervention group. And there's no difference on their instructional support. They all get worse across the year between September, October, and April, May. Okay. As we say in the States, there's only three months of teaching that go on during a school year, uh, uh, and that is October. September is adaptation. November is Thanksgiving in America, so nothing gets done. And then, of course, December is just Christmas parties. January is a really good month, and so is February. And then after that, again, nothing gets done because you get achievement testing and then springtime. So even though children are in school a long time, there are really certain periods where children are learning a lot and others in which they're not. And there are certain periods where teachers are teaching much better than they are in other periods. Okay. So th I think this data is impressive because we use a large, it's a large scale study. Uh, we have a lot of teachers that are very diverse and they're diverse in the kind of schools they're teaching in. Almost all are very high risk, very low income schools. And uh, so they're teaching in what you'd call battlefield conditions. And we're seeing that um, 
a mindfulness approach that is just for the teachers is not only helping their behavior, both their depression and anxiety, their hurry and their, their sense of efficacy, so both negative and positive, but it's actually changing their observed teaching practices. Okay? So the next steps is we're starting to start to look at student outcomes. So we have teacher reported outcomes of students on their academic competence. Of course, these are going to be biased by the fact that teachers are either in the intervention or not, so that could affect their, their, their bias. But we also have school record data. Trying to get school record data from New York City takes a while, but we're getting attendance, discipline, uh, grades, and test scores. And we're, we're hoping, there's some, some preliminary evidence from our first cohort that there's some effects that, uh, that actually bleed already into uh, achievement test scores. But we'll see what happens. Of course, we're interested in moderation. Is the care intervention especially effective for teachers, classrooms, or students that have more severe problems at baseline? So we've just looked at the moderation of teachers. We thought teachers that might start out with greater uh, distress, the self-reported symptoms of depression, anxiety, stress, would be more affected by it. But it looks like there's, there's no moderated effect on teacher characteristics, uh, that is. And that's actually good in some ways. That means that across the board, across the spectrum, it's improving in general a small amount for all teachers. Sort of like Jeffrey Rose's ideas in the prevention paradox is that um, you don't really just need to focus on those teachers that are high risk. You can help move the entire population, if you will. Uh, we don't know yet for kids, and of course we're now starting to do mediation analyses. They get complicated in HLM models, <laughs> but um, to see if the proximal effects of teachers' improvements will mediate effects on students if we have good student outcomes. And also we're looking at in the in the macro way the teachers change, for example, in mindfulness mediate their changes in other things. Okay. As much as you can believe that the self-reported mindfulness scales measure change. They're probably good as trait measures. We're not so good at, at them as change measures. Um, how am I doing? Uh, Ten more minutes. Okay. I'm going to tell you about another project quickly. And the reason why is that um, retreats are great, but we have to have a lot of different models of how we can do this work. Okay. So I decided, uh, I, I was meeting with our staff about four or five years ago, and I said, well, let's completely change what we're doing. Let's do a completely new model. And that's a model that happens in the school building in the morning for 18 minutes before school starts. Okay, so we went and did focus groups with teachers, tried to find out if teachers would come, for how long. They all wanted it after school, but I, I would not relent because I wanted it to help them meet the day and meet the students, right? So that's what Calm is. It was developed at Penn State uh, by uh, Alexis Harris, who's now in uh, Louisville, part of the University of Virginia. And it's based on gentle yoga and mindfulness practices, designed to promote health and well-being among educators, of course. And it's 64 scripted sessions that are 18 minutes long. Okay? So it goes over 16 weeks, four days a week. So, so from, th from Tuesday through Friday every week, there's a yoga teacher trained in our model that's at the building in a room that has yoga mats, and any teacher that wants to can come in and spend time. And we suggest that teachers in general come two days a week. We thought that was maybe reasonable, and on average teachers come about 1.7 or so times per week. So they, they seem to, once they, they come, they, they stay. It's about 20 minutes, it's four days a week, uh, and I'll just give you a sense of what, what, how can you do this in 18 minutes. <laughs> we welcome them. We do a centering activity, maybe like, just like I had done with you at the start of this. It might be physical centering to the present moment. We might do three breaths, which we do with them regularly. There's a breath awareness practice, and depending upon the week, it, uh, in a yogic model, it, 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 it changes what breath practices we'll be doing for the week. Um, same with movement practices. That we call it yoga because we know that people will come more if we call it yoga than if we call it mindfulness. Especially women in, in America, about 20% of women uh, at any one time are going to yoga classes. Yoga is very popular. And so now they're, instead of having to pay for yoga, they're getting it for free in their building. That's the idea. Okay? Uh, and so very simple poses. We wanted this to be something that someone who's obese or disabled could do. There are no, down, no downward dogs or anything like that. It's, this is not physical yoga. This is the idea of becoming mindful in poses. It's all about mindfulness. Uh, and then we revisit the breath. We might do a final relax ex relaxation exercise. It could be a self-care, or it could be a compassion or loving kindness. And we have a close, closing intention setting. So the intention setting might be, today we talked about what it means to, to, um, uh, to notice things. So t today, our intention is going to be, when we leave today, is to notice when people are doing things for us today. Just notice, just to notice. 
no more than that, okay? Uh, so we have these sustained daily sessions. We're interested in the proximal processes of mindful awareness of body, self-regulatory skills, being more relaxed, having a more positive emotional experience early in the day, and having a sense of community with your colleagues. And we think that should translate into good outcomes. So this is a relatively small trial. We had two middle schools, so there are secondary schools in Pennsylvania. They were randomized, intervention and awareness control. We had 64 educators, uh, average of 14 years of experience. They were randomized to get this or not. And I'll just quickly show you some data. So they did improve on the observer of, of mindfulness, but just barely, um, in terms of self-report. Um, they improved in their work-related function, their, uh, their classroom management skills, and uh, they were showed a change, a positive improvement in depersonalization on a burnout scale. Again, small ends, so the, the effects, as you see, the effect sizes are not bad, but they are only at, at the, a trend level of significance. Um, here's an example of the self-efficacy data, and what you can see is that the controls aren't changing across the year, and the interventions are improving in their sense of efficacy as teachers. Um, in terms of emotional regulation and well-being, we use the distress tolerance scale, and you can see we have effects on, um, on their tolerance of negative emotions and their regulation, and pretty good effect sizes for a small trial. And that's what you see for distress tolerance is a small decline in the uh, control group and a, small, and a pretty good increase in the, in the intervention group. Uh, and we looked at their task-related hurry again. I've shown you hurry twice already. You see an effect size of 0.41 on their sense of being less hurried, even though nothing's changed about their schedules. And, um, and uh, a non-significant effect on perceived stress. Um, we have an effect on their diastolic and systolic blood pressure. So we took blood pressure data and a variety of physical uh, measures before and afterwards. And um, also a significant effect on their daily physical symptoms again. This is what the diastolic blood pressure data looks like. And this is similar, very similar effect size to what you see from blood pressure intervention programs. Okay? There have been a number of mindfulness trials that have shown blood pressure effects. And we also let's see daily physical symptoms. In addition, uh, we did uh, cortisol. We did waking, we did uh, cortisol five times a day before and afterwards. And I'm sorry I don't have the slides with me today, but we saw a significant effect on the awakening morning cortisol response, which is just the first 30 minute rise. And what we saw is that uh, at the beginning of the year, both intervention and control teachers have a nice rise. But by the end of the year, just like teaching declines in the control group, the rise is much lower in the, in, in the control teachers. And because we also did cortisol again the following fall, what we see is they recover over the summer and they go back. So what happens is in the intervention group, they stayed with a steep rise across the entire year. And in the control group, the teachers rise substantially declined, which means they're, they're, they're not recovering overnight, if you will, from, the, from their stresses. Okay, so I'm interested in this mindfulness in everyday context. Uh, as you can see, I'm interested in how we can translate mindfulness to what people are doing every day. And um, um, just another cartoon, damn it, Gloria, here I am meditating, attaining all this inner peace and joy, and you interrupt just to find out what the hell I want for dinner. Okay. And um, there can be a lot of sanctimony in mindfulness. In fact, there is a lot of sanctimony in this in mindfulness, mindfulness world. So I want to think about a big picture here. So what I think is we've, we've, uh, we've really privileged a certain number of measures and practices. Uh, and um, it's partly because of the traditions where, where mindfulness research has come from and also because of what's easy versus hard to measure and study. We've mostly focused on interpersonal mindfulness activities. Forms of sitting meditation, which we know have often different sitting meditation practices have different outcomes. Walking meditation. There's been some forms of yoga that have been studied extensively, and there's almost no work yet on prayer. Okay? But the interpersonal aspects of mindfulness and the kinds of activities we might do in these areas are almost completely unstudied. Okay? There's almost no work on it. Yet, in fact, if you think about the normal, everyday public, most of them are much more interested in these activities than they are in sitting meditation. Okay, sitting meditation is going to work for some people in the short run, a very small number of people in the long run, and not at all for most, most people, is my belief. Okay? Uh, so what about deep listening? What about storytelling? Right? Contemplative storytelling is a very rich tradition. It's in almost every culture for a long time, and it's a very deep way to learn. Um, 
uh, con contemplative dialogue and discourse. Of course, this is what Buddhist monks do in their training. Mostly they don't meditate. Mostly they do ritual and they do contemplative discourse. Um, council procedures and groups. Anyone ever held a walk, the talking stick as you go around and do uh, talking with people? That's a, what's called a council procedure. It's a way of regulating interpersonal relationships in a mindful way. There are certain forms of martial arts uh, that are very common other than yoga like Tai Chi and Qigong, et cetera, that if they're done in a certain way can be extremely mindful practices. And for many people, they're much more attractive practices than, uh, than sitting meditation. There's forms of service learning. Uh, we call that in America, where students in, in secondary schools go out and do things in the community to be helpful. But if there's a real reflective process before and afterwards, that can be a very contemplative practice. And of course, there's contemplative art and music. And have you ever gone to see a contemplative art or music uh, uh, Exhibition or or uh, or concert? None of you. Oh, well, one could take that mode to, to anything one. Exactly. To. That's <laughs> the point. You can apply it to any mode. And of course, the most important is contemplating the natural world, right? That's what most humans have done for most of humanity. We've laid on the ground at night and watched the stars and felt absorbed in that sense of oneness, right? Or watched a fire. Who who isn't who isn't mystified by watching a, a good fire, right? These are ways that people deeply get drawn in to things outside of themselves that are natural practices. And of course, there's awareness during daily activities. I, I use uh, uh, dishwashing as one of my mindfulness practices. I love to wash dishes. Then there's types of outcomes. There's interpersonal outcomes like brain activity and symptoms and self-reports of mindfulness. But there are interpersonal outcomes, which have hardly been studied, like self-awareness in your everyday interactions or self-regulation in your everyday interactions, or self-reports of your mindfulness with others, or and maybe measured in many ways, compassion for oneself and compassion for others. Okay? So we know a lot about that. That's the, that's the quadrant we know something about. We've learned a fair amount, especially with adults. We don't know hardly anything about how interpersonal activities might predict interpersonal outcomes. We know almost nothing about how typical privileged forms of mindfulness like yoga and meditation affect interpersonal outcomes. We know a little bit about that. Uh, much of it done here. Uh, and we know almost nothing about how the interpersonal activities might affect the intrapersonal outcomes. Okay? So there's really a broad, I think there's a broad agenda here, uh, much broader than, than what's been done so far. Uh, if we're interested in introducing mindfulness in ways that it will attract a large public health effect. Okay, so I'm just going to end by saying there's, there's one more aspect of this I think is important. And that is that really in any spiritual tradition, it doesn't matter which one it is, uh, there are three, really three components. There are practices, which might be a sitting meditation or prayer. It could be all kinds of different practices. Uh, chanting, singing, very common in most spiritual practices. There's the Dharma or worldview or orientation. No one's ever gone to a Catholic church and not heard a homily. No one's ever gone to a synagogue and not heard a sermon, right? And no one ever goes to a, to a mindfulness retreat and doesn't hear a Dharma talk, okay? Because worldviews are critically important. This is what Krishnamurti was talking about, right? This is Krishnamurti's main point, was worldviews. And this is whole, held together by a sangha or a community that has both explicit and implicit norms that support the development of these abilities in people, okay? So when we think about mindfulness, really we're thinking about three things, I think. We're thinking about practices, dharma, and we're thinking about community. Now, what we focus mostly on is practices, right? But my sense is that a lot of the variance and change is not going to be primarily in the practices. It's going to be in the worldview. In fact, I think we should do trials where we just do dharma talks without mindfulness, without mindfulness practice versus the combination. We should understand these better than we do now. And, and from the Sangha or the community, which makes me very concerned about how we're going to do this in a web-based model, which is going on lots of places in the world now where people are doing web-based delivery of mindfulness. And how much is lost when there isn't a Sangha or a community that, that holds this, just like in any religion. I mean, if you were going to do, I mean, we, televangelists, <laughs> televangelists have done this in, in Christianity for, for 50 years, right? right? You turn on television Sunday morning instead of going to church, right? But there isn't a sense of sangha or community that holds the values for you. You turn off the channel and boom, right? 
So how much role is the community process in this? I, I don't think we know. We don't know how much variance might be accounted for by the three different processes and their interactions. And now think about this developmentally, starting in young children, going through all the way to adulthood and to old age, right? It may be that different times and with different interventions, different proportions of variance and change will be explained by these different aspects of the phenomena. And we really need to pay more attention, I think, to these components uh, in understanding both how our interventions work, but also how to develop more effective ones. Okay. And with that, even though I have a couple more slides, I'll just say that here's the problem. Too busy to meditate, try the Buddha patch right, in jail or suppository. And we have to resist this idea that this is, this is easy, it's an easy fix. Right? Instead, we're really trying to think about what you might talk about as a project on human development, on human well-being. And, and these are long-term processes that people slowly, people engage in and slowly have developmental change. And we want to respect the fact that we know so little from trials that look at six months or a year of, of what the full impact of these outcomes might be. And with that, I'll conclude. I'll probably leave. <laughs>